Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Quave, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about food, food waste, and sustainability. And I have a fabulous guest that's going to join us today. Her name is Alejandra Schrader. And Alejandra is an award-winning cookbook author, a plant-based nutrition certified chef, a food TV personality and an activist. What really inspires me about her work is that she encourages people to eat in a way that benefits not just us as humans, but also the planet. So she's touching on human and planetary health. And her goal is to encourage folks to really consume a wider variety of edible plants and to minimize food waste and to cook smartly. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Alejandra's book. She has a new book. It's called The Low Carbon Cookbook and Action Plan, Reduce Waste and Combat Climate Change with 140 Sustainable Plant-Based Recipes. This book won the 2021 Gourmand World Cookbook Awards for the U.S. in the food waste category. Alejandra has been invited to share her expertise on sustainable food systems at the United Nations and the World Bank. And her interviews have been featured in the New York Times and Forbes magazine. She's done TV appearances on national shows in both the US and Canada. And lastly, as an ambassador for the Periodic Table of Food Initiative, she also collaborates with the science community to study the biochemical composition of foods. She's a founding member of the Chef's Manifesto and a sister on the Planet Ambassador for Oxfam America. Alejandra, it is such a tremendous pleasure to meet you. Um, I love your cookbook and I can't wait to share it with our listeners. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm super excited to chat with you today. Great. Well, I always like to start this question with all of my authors, but maybe maybe why don't we start um, by just diving into what motivated you, you to write this cookbook that touches on climate change in addition to recipes? Well, the cookbook was basically 10 years in the making, all in my head, just knowing that I wanted to share this passion for sustainable food and uh, for the food that is not only good for our bodies, but also for Mother Earth. And I think the real push was the pandemic. The pandemic put my food business out and I had then a lot more time in my hands. And finally, I was able to dive into this project that I wanted to have the time to work for my, you know, my whole culinary career. And I'm just really grateful that a few months into the pandemic, I was reached out by a a Penguin Random House publisher and I had that chance that I wanted. So from something negative, something really positive came about. Uh, But the book gave me the opportunity to share, because, you know, we talk about food and in the science community, in the sustainable community, and um, it, and it, it's all true, and the numbers are, you know, the facts are right in our face. But unless we make food delicious, colorful, mouthwatering, and accessible to people, all that data doesn't really translate into people being able to utilize it for their benefit. Um, and that's where I feel so grateful to to be able to get, you know, to bridge that gap and to. And to make the information digestible, to share it with people. And and by the way, let's make this food not just really good and healthy and sustainable, but also delicious. That's great. Well, as a mom, I'm always looking for new recipes that do exactly that. Because, you know, I think that we're just bombarded by so much industrially processed food constantly. And our kids are as well. So I know I probably speak for many in the audience. You know, we all want to eat well, but we also want to eat things that are easy. We're not all chefs. So maybe you can give us some examples. Um, I mean, can you cook sustainably in an easy way? We don't all have to be chefs to do this, right? Yes. No, you don't. You don't. And um, I totally relate to what you're saying. I'm the mother of a toddler. So as I worked on my book, I also became pregnant for the first time at 46. And so I birthed two babies. And it was a great opportunity for me to walk the talk and, uh, and to prove other moms and busy professionals um, that there is a way to cook uh, for ourselves, which helps Mother Earth because we avoid food waste. It helps our pocket because we are able to 
you know, meal prep and uh, plan ahead and freeze meals and, you know, warm them up later in the week. Um, but also in a way that it benefits our health. And I think um, as a mother, I'm hyper aware of feeding my child in a way that helps him thrive for life. And uh, because I didn't have that. I grew up very poor in a third world country in Venezuela. And my mother was a doctor in pharmaceutics. So we're talking about a, a highly educated professional, but unfortunately, because of our culture and the financial access to food, it didn't translate into me having great food. I had a great education. She kept me in private school, but I didn't. And we were very food insecure. And that at a personal level has translated into a lifelong issues with obesity, and uh, and just my, and and the byproducts of malnutrition. So, one of your guests that I I love to hear about, Dr. Uh, Reynald Jones, about the importance of building up that microbiome from early age. And uh, so, like I am that mom, uh, and I'm super busy. I travel around the world, but so I'm like, if if I can do it, <laughs> you know, other people can. I stuck my freezer and my refrigerator with gut friendly foods for my toddler because I want to help him thrive. And I understand that connection um, between our gut and our health. Um, but I think the key to, to summarize it for those that are trying to cook better in half the time for it is meal planning and meal prep. Separate a couple of hours every Sunday for you to get in the kitchen and, and plan at least four meals that you can heat up throughout the week. And that way you don't have to dedicate each day time for cooking. That's such great advice. I mean, well, there's two things I want to touch on here. And we're one is gut friendly food. What is that? Are we talking about fiber? Are we talking about whole vegetables? Like, what do you mean by gut friendly food? Um, I, we're talking about it all, right? We're talking about probiotics and prebiotic filled food. We're talking about a lot of fiber, healthy fats, um, and, and foods that feed that, that gut flora that affects so much. I mean, I, we could talk about that forever. Cause I'm like that chef that just loves the science behind, you know, how does that gut affect our mental health? I talk about it all the time. I am a clinical depression patient that doesn't need medication because I feed in a way that my gut flora keeps sending all that serotonin up to my brain. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I, th I think this is the key. And when I talk about nutrition equality, it is easy for me to say, because I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford the flax seeds and the hemp seeds and the Greek organic grass fed yogurt and all of these got friendly foods. But for those that can't afford that, I try to find creative ways to and, and ideas as to, well, guess what? There's a lot of fiber in banana peel and plantain peel, and we normally throw it away. So how about we shred it? We discard that white membrane that makes that texture funky. And then we um, cook it with some aromatics like onions and garlic and spices, not heat, but uh, flavorful spices like paprika and cumin and coriander. And then we make a beef like stew that we can serve over brown rice or amaranth. And that way we are still getting the gut friendly fiber in a much more affordable way. I love, I love this idea. I mean, we've had some other episodes talking about how to capture some of the waste stream in our, in our kitchens. And I, you probably have gleaned this from listening to some of the episodes. I'm a huge fan of fermentation as a tool to do that. Um, but I've never thought about other ways to capture fiber. I mean, that's such a great, great idea. And, you know, you're talking about yogurt. I, I want to remind our listeners too, you don't have to buy this expensive yogurt every week. You only need it once. You only need it once because then it's so easy to make yogurt at home. I mean, if I can do this with my schedule, like anybody can do this. It's, it, you know, you just, you need one spoon of that starter of those live microbes and you can keep yogurt going um, just with milk. 
you know, yeah. and, and cooking it and adding the, yeah. So those and are such great tips. Regular, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, and you don't even need regular milk. Um, one of the recipes in my book is a cultured cashew yogurt where you're like grinding the cashews, which are, you know, great protein, amazing fats, softening them up, uh, using your blender to, to make a cream like uh, paste. And then whether you use a, a natural starter from another yogurt or you use probiotic uh, pills um, and you can just open that capsule, uh, add it on, put a nice cheesecloth over it and let it sit in the counter for a few days, two, three days. And now you have plant-based culture uh, yogurt that is so much cheaper than what uh, the alternatives that are available in the market these days. I love any recipe, which requires me just to like put a cover on it and put it aside. That's like, that's my kind of cooking. I love, I love, I love the ease of that. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, let's get into, um, well, before we move on, cause I do want to get onto the carbon aspects of the book, but first let's talk a little bit more about this idea of meal planning and meal prepping, because I know for me, this is an area where I always have the best of intentions and I'll do it for a couple of weeks and then I kind of fall off the wagon. And then I'm like at panic mode, it's 5.30 PM when I get home, I'm like, oh wow, we have nothing to cook today. Um, so what do you have any kind of tips for those of us that are looking to you know, do better at meal planning? Because really meal planning also saves a lot of money in the end of things, yeah. right? So what are some tips you might be able to offer us? Well, so as far as like saving money, buying, you know, it sounds so cliche, but buying whatever is seasonal and whatever is local, it's always going to be cheaper um, because the air miles also imply air money. Um, but, uh, you know, going to the market, to the farmer's market, to your produce stand nearby and getting whatever is cheapest, most available. Um, and then getting home, and uh, if it, if it's if this is on a weekend, then get right into it, peel it, chop it, and put it in bags. That's like the level A of uh, food, you know, meal prepping. Um, if you're not able to complete a full dish that day, at least if I get home and I have some cooked lentils, some chopped peppers and onions, and some cooked quinoa. I have a meal right there that I can put together in five minutes or less, like honest. Um, uh, and then, you know, level B or C would be actually having already the recipes that you want to work. But here's where the, the, the reality uh, and, and the science backs it up. Like when we cook at home, we want to avoid food, maximize the investment that we've made in the food that we've purchased that we got that we get to control a lot more the ingredients that are in our food um you know so we, we do know that you're not going to be adding some uh extra processed uh you know uh msg you know in, in spanish we actually all those ingredients it. we can't pronounce in the labels basically yeah, those yeah. Ingredients <laughs> that we can't pronounce and yeah. the preservatives and whatnot um, and so we're eating better, we're eating healthier, we're eating more sustainably, we're saving money, we're feeding our gut flora. Um, and, um, and, I, and what I, what I want to encourage people is, you know, the, the practice makes the master, the more that we do it, the easier that it becomes, the more enjoyable that it is. Cause now we're not worrying about how long it's taking, but you know, as you chop those sweet potatoes and that eggplant and, you know, you are already knowing the investment. It's like Dr. Jones talks about, you know, taking the people in the drive through with that buzz, you know, like I am excited. I know uh, that this is going to have positive repercussions in my life and in my pocket. That's great. And you're also, as you said, by focusing on local, that in itself is also sustainable, right? right. And you're also supporting local farmers. So right. that's a right. great, great point of transition. Let's talk a little bit about through this idea of the low carbon cookbook um, or low carbon cooking. Like what can we do to support a more sustainable diet? Like, is it really only about buying local or what all does that entail? Oh, no, there is so much more than that. So 
Um, I first, you know, since this is such a science-based uh, show, I, you know, and I try to keep up with the data because the sad reality is that it changes so quickly. You know, when I was working on my book in uh, mid-2020, you know, at the time the data reflected that about 26% of the overall generated greenhouse gases came from food. And less than a year later, that percentage had gone up to 36%, like, a, you know, from one quarter to one third in less than a year, which is so alarming for me to hear. Um, and the, the science also uh, talks about, you know, sustain, eating sustainably. No, I'm not telling everyone you have to go vegan. No, I'm not telling everyone you can only buy local, right? Because people, you know, I've lived, I went to University of Michigan, Ann Arbor for my master's, and I know in the middle of the dead winter, you can't buy, uh, or you don't have as much access to fresh, you know, produce, parenthesis, fermenting, um, and uh, preserving food is just such a great way to continue to have that access, even through severe weather. Um, but so basically the number one offender uh, uh, when it comes to carbon produ production in food is red meat, ruminants. And um, you know, that, that enteric fermentation that happens, uh, the methane gas production that occurs. Unfortunately, what we feed in America to our, um, you know, in, in, the, in the beef, in the industrialized beef production, it's just really bad for the environment. So there are science-based studies like the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Report Commission that talk about like, well, we're not telling you not to eat red meat, but what if you cut your red meat, red meat intake to about half? It could cut your carbon footprint, your individual carbon footprint. How much food you eat affects the environment by 40%. To me, that was quite empowering uh, because I was like, well, then there is something I can do. A lot of people understand how daunting the climate crisis is, but they're like, well, but nothing that I can do is really going to help. And I revert to a Venezuelan saying where I grew up that every grain of sand helps build a mountain. Everybody can put a little grain of sand to do their part to fight the climate crisis, correct? And so maybe making the sacrifice of not uh, having, and you know, especially in America where our per capita intake of red meat is insane. Um, we're second after Australia, but it's still really, really high. And then instead going to more sustainable foods, for instance, pulses, dry beans, peas, lentils, because these are, first of all, amazing sources of plant-based nutrition, plant-based nutrition. They're also really, 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 really affordable. Um, to me, they're delicious. I am a proud beaner and promoter of beans, but also the um, uh, bean, the pulses and beans are part of the legume food family, which is my favorite food group because it's highly sustainable. And the main reason why is because legumes, the plants of legumes and legume crops help reintroduce nitrogen into the ground. They're nitrogen fixing machines. They help digest the nitrogen into a way that is absorbable uh, by the soil and it enriches our soil. It helps farmers avoid um, uh, fertilizers like uh, uh, artificial fertilizers. And, uh, and, 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 it, and that translates even into the, uh, you know, our human health and what we're intaking. So there are things that we can do to eat more sustainably, but also I think it's like everybody wins, you know, it's better for the environment. It's so much better for our human health and also good for, like you were talking about, for the livelihoods of those that work the land. I think and that's such a beautiful way of thinking about it. You know, I think we don't we don't pay enough attention to the soil, you know, the structure of the soil, the richness of the soil. You know, some scientists say we're in a soil crisis right now because of the depletion of nutrients from much of our soil for agriculture. And I agree. I think growing beans 
plants from this bean family with nitrogen fixating bacteria can definitely enrich the soil for nitrogen. But even, perhaps even more importantly, it reduces our reliance on petroleum products because, you know, maybe some of the listeners don't realize this, but many of our agrochemicals for, you know, fertilizers originate in the oil industry, in petroleum products. So it's just one of those additional things that we don't think about that's, you know, we're using um, the, the oil and petroleum industry to, to also feed our planet. And I think that's a dangerous reliance. So that's a- And yeah. these artificial fertilizers also deplete the quality of our soils. If you ever, if you ever walk by a, a monocrop farming area and you, and you touch the soil and there's like this block of like sandy, you know, like mess instead of beautiful, moist, dark, full of warmth, uh, which is what our soils are meant to be. And, and also then because of the, 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 you know, the fact that we're taking away the health from our soils is also um, the farming techniques that are used in monocrop farming are disturbing our storage, our, our carbon pools, which release them back into the air and it only uh, damages the atmosphere and the environment more and more. So we, you know, I, I think I will bring it back to food and say, you know, food is such a powerful ally when it comes to mitigating the climate crisis. And if people are aware that our choices, like every individual action is huge as part of a collective effort. So I am that person like, you know, and, and I want to bring this back to your episode with, um, Alexis Nicole, uh, who is, I am such a like big fan because she's like, I know not everyone has this kind of excitement, you know, about food or sustainable food, but if my excitement can in, in fact, you know, like, like go to one other person and be like, well, she seemed really into this. Maybe there's something about it. Then I, then my job will be done, you know? Um, yeah, it, I, I am quite uh, excited and inspired to talk about it, maybe because I didn't have it, maybe because I value it that much more. You talked about petroleum. I come from Venezuela, formerly the third largest producer of oil in the world, and our economy unfortunately relied on it too much that our farmers left the fields. So this is a very personal issue to me, uh, food our access to it, what nutrition means for our health and what the way we, and how the way we eat affects the planet. It's a full circle. Yeah, that's beautifully said. I mean, I have a similar, you know, kind of connection to beef. You know, I grew up in a beef cattle um, farming community. My, my, my family's income was tied to beef cattle and, um, you know, I grew up in the era where they had bumper stickers that said, eat more beef. Like there, <laughs> there were, there was like a concerted ad campaign to really get more beef, but you're right. I mean, it, it's, I think for the listeners out there that, that are omnivores that eat meats and vegetables and fish and everything, you know, this isn't about cutting out all meat, although there are certainly health benefits to a vegetarian diet, um, but just some reduction. It's not just that it's good for the planet. It's also really good for you. If you look at the health of, of people that live in countries and in regions where, which are known as the blue zones, the places where you have the longest lived individuals, they're not eating huge amounts of red meat on a regular basis. You know, they, they have it occasionally. Um, and I think that's something that we can also learn from. It's like, so again, human and planetary health are tightly intertwined. And when we treat one well, we're going to treat the other well. And we have to kind of get into that mindset because, yeah, I think sometimes it's hard for people to think, well, I'm doing this for the good of the planet. Um, but if I say, well, I'm doing it for the good of the planet and for myself, that gives me double motivation. Right. And I think it's something we can all do. And you talk about, so two things that are really important uh, from what you just said, one, it has to be like, no, it's not all or nothing. It's not like you need to quit. But how about we diversify the base? Like I always talk about that. Imagine that we're artists and we have this palette. You know, you have two, three colors. You know, it's really boring. But if you add a plethora of colors to this palette and you diversify your culinary palette, 
So how about you diversify your omnivore that, uh, uh, palette? And, and so you talked about the blue zones. My husband's family is from Icaria in Greece. And, you know, you go there and they, they kill the prize goat and they bring you the, you know, the fish that they just um, acquired, you know, right in front of their homes and the, and the homemade cheese and that is unpasteurized, by the way. Um, and, uh, um, and all of these fresh, you know, produce, like, yes, then I can see why. So th that goat was also not raised on a, you know, two by four, uh, you know, space in a, in a, uh, you know, in a warehouse. Uh, it was free roaming. It was uh, helping the, you know, the biodynamic of that other, of their little farms. And, and so it, it's a whole different story. I think that when we also say like, yeah, I'm not going to have meat once a week, that helps. I'm not going to have meat, you know, for the dinner blocks of this week, that helps. And, and then what can I eat instead? Even if you want an animal source protein, go to lamb, go to you know, fish, try a new fish, try a new bivalve, uh, uh, like mussels, clams, uh, they are um, very sustainable, you know, and they are so nutrient rich. So I think it's also about just being adventurous and trying new foods because we're not doing a good job. I will leave another little stat here. By the time I was working on my book, the the you know the studies show that there were about thirty thousand edible plants on this earth, and as humans, we eat about thirty of them. What a bad job we're doing! Uh, and even worse, that about sixty percent sixty percent of the calories that we intake as humans come from three crops: rice, milk, uh, corn, and soy. That is awful. Uh, now the science is showing that we're more uh, probably getting to over 40 or even 50,000 varieties of edible plants. So we just need to do a better job um, at eating a more diverse um, diet, that helps the environment in so many different ways. Uh, talking about soil health, uh, biodiversity is what will be available for our future generations. I have a one and a half, almost two year old kid that I want to be able to try so many of the foods that I grew up eating and so many are in real risk of extinction. So how do we eat more biodiverse? We go, whether you're going to a, a grocery store, a supermarket, a farmer's market, try to spot one ingredient that you've never cooked with before. Oh wait, this looks like a funny like potato, but the top is purple and the bottom is white. Like, what is this? If you're at a farmer's market, that person will be so happy to tell you what it is. How do you cook it? What do you serve it with? Oh, that's rutabaga. It's amazing. It's a little, da, da, da. and this is how you cook it. Um, and if not, lucky for us, we can just Google <laughs> or even take a picture um, in some app and then it will tell you what it is. And then now you've incorporated one new ingredient to your diet, to your culinary palate, and little by little, you, you, you'll get to know more ingredients. And then you also testing is what allows you to understand what your palate likes and what it does. Yeah. How to know. Well, this is, this feeds into another theme that I know you've spoken a lot about and it's eating the rainbow, right? We're trying to eat. Yeah. When we say eat the rainbow, we're talking about the colors of our foods, but the colors represent the chemistry of our foods. And so you're really getting a diversity of nutrients and micronutrients that way. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like how do you yeah. integrate color into your diet? Yes. Cause every food, every food color uh, brings a new set of nutrients, even the white ones. It's really funny because growing up, I had a real, real like fit, fit sister. And she's like, no, we cannot eat anything that's white because if it's white, it doesn't have. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, she was wrong, right? Because then, you know, uh, whether it's, we're talking about potatoes or parsnips or, or fennel, you know, uh, white brings also nutrients and there's the potassium and the vitamin K. And uh, so each color of our food rainbow uh, brings uh, different um, 
kind of nutrient and uh, antioxidants and phytochemicals and um, and minerals and vitamins and in order for us to benefit the most you know i am a strong believer that food is medicine i'm actually proof i have We'll get, we may not be able to get into this, but I believe that my pregnancy for the first time at 46 came about pursuing a plant forward and plant based diet and cleaning my body and allowing all these nutrients to heal me from the inside out. Uh, but if we are able to eat from all the diversity of colors that Mother Earth has to offer, then we're able also to reap the benefits of all the nutrients available and uh, and 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 the and the like I mentioned, you know, the phytochemicals and all all the antioxidants and the anti-inflammatory properties that we we need every possible ally when it comes to fighting free radicals. <laughs> yeah, I mean this this ties in so beautifully too. You know, I see, I see these trends online, especially TikTok or social media, where they're all about gut cleanses and I'm going to cleanse my body with all these different things. I'm like, no, just drink water and eat a plant forward diet. That is what it takes to really cleanse your body. Eat local plants, <laughs> drink water. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's, you know, reduce your intake of a lot of these processed foods of the, 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 you know, sugar laden beverages There are a lot of health foods. And I put this in parentheses or quotes is like health foods or things that are marketed as health foods that are actually just laden with things like corn syrup. And yeah, maybe they have some kale or blueberry, but it's more corn syrup than anything else. So I think, um, and this gets back to getting in the kitchen, right. And, and and building your, your skills in, um, in preparing healthy, nutritious plant based foods. Or to, for, to heal your body yes yes and for those yeah. that are super health conscious and they want to you know be fit and and be athletic and they spend you know a, a, a amazing amount of hours in the gymnasium you know like trying to build their muscles i think we if we start to see the the being in the kitchen as an investment also in our health and even that um uh, that you know that wholesome uh, well-being, you know, then then it wouldn't seem as threatening, and it would just feel, uh, uh, you know, the kitchen is my zen place, uh, and I and I'm just really grateful that I have that um, as a gift for my culture because culturally we couldn't afford the. Well, we, I didn't even honestly. I mean, I moved to America in my twenties, and I never had seen a microwavable dinner. Thank God, <laughs> yeah, um, or you know, canned or frozen, although there is some benefit, again, especially in areas where fresh produce is not as readily available. Um, yes, frozen, picked on the peak of the season uh, is much better. There are implications for the environment, but we have to pick our battles, right? And when nutrition is not readily available and accessible for many, I say, get the can, get the frozen thing. By the way, if you're getting the can, if you're cooking chickpeas, don't throw away that aquafaba that viscous water that the chick the chickpeas or the garbanzo beans are um are floating in because there's a lot of good stuff in there and we can use that to for baking as an egg substitute uh i actually just made for the periodic table of food initiative these pavlovas um that don't have any eggs they're they just have the that aquafaba uh, so there's just fun I, I think there's fun things to discover and fun uh, things to do. And I, I want it before, you know, this, this uh, conversation ends, I do want to talk about the periodic table of food initiative. Yeah. I was just about um, to ask that, like, maybe what is a periodic table of food initiative? I, we know it's a Rockefeller founded or funded initiative, but what are they doing? Yes. So they are basically trying to build a database that is going to be public accessible for everyone and that it gives us the real like the real deal are real not that i'm sorry like not so good to not call it something else nutrition label in the back of our our foods but a true uh, database for the biochemical composition of food and they you know they they start the database and now they make the technology available for 
uh, people around the globe uh, to to add on to it and uh, depending also on the regional uh, foods um, and uh, I am super excited about it because when I first met with the Rockefeller Foundation I was down in Colombia and, uh, and it was the inauguration of a seed bank right talk about preserving the future of food um, and this particular seed bank being in Colombia uh, is most you know they're all over 40 thousand varieties of beans you know so it, I was less needless to say I was in heaven uh, and uh, this inauguration is a high profile there's a, a, I mean the science community was ever so present and the president of Colombia was actually in um, in in this gathering and why do I cook for them as a main dish food waste I cooked a plantain peel uh, shredded beef right um, and, uh, you know, when I got together with them, um, they are like, wow, you're cooking food waste. And I said, yeah, you know, and culturally, and a lot of my indigenous ancestors have used a lot of the avocado seeds and the papaya seeds and the fava bean pods and the, the, um, you know, the, the stalks of the cauliflower and the broccoli. And a lot of them claim nutritional and medicinal properties to these food waste items. The truth is, unfortunately, I don't have the real science to back up these claims. So I still, uh, you know, talk about their benefits from an ancestral and indigenous stand standpoint, but I need the science to help me here. And so the fact that I, that conversation sparked their interest in bringing in food waste items into this database and that as we speak, Papaya seeds are being analyzed and, and avocado seeds being analyzed and aquafaba is being analyzed. It, it, it fills me with so much joy, um, again, because this could be potential, you know, food, uh, nutrient rich foods that are available then to people, even in underprivileged communities. And now because of this database, they will be oh yeah, I mean, not only I'm eating food waste, but I'm also you know, like reaping on the benefits of all these anti-inflammatory, you know, like phytochemicals. That's amazing. I, I'm really excited about this, this initiative. It'll be so interesting to see, yeah, to learn like what are the micronutrients in these different food items and there, and what's really, I think impressive is they're looking at foods, as you said, what we might consider food waste, but is actually an ancestral food. And then also really foods from all over the globe. And um, this is going to be a tremendous resource because, you know, we are facing challenges with climate change. Um, you know, not all of our crops are going to be able to survive well going into the next century. We have to think about what other foods might we grow or how do we adapt to these changing conditions, increasing salinity, you know, in our soils or poorer soils, um, you know, there, there's just so many different factors that we'll, we're going to have to consider. And so having this nutritional information is going to be really key in helping us be guided as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and, and it's going to allow us all to understand what really is in our food. You know, like late last year, I was cooking a dinner, um, uh, for an event where we were celebrating that the gut had been officially accepted as the hallmark of cancer you know yeah. and so i designed a full menu um that was embracing fiber rich foods and healthy mm -hmm. fats and citrix and you know probiotic rich foods and um and i cannot help to sometimes have to reflect and be like well but if i was in venezuela in the middle of a humanitarian crisis which my country is you know one of my countries yeah. in america but you know it's facing what would i resource to you know so quinoa is really expensive even though it comes from right down the road in peru but now you know the first uh, developed countries are demanding it a lot and so you know that's that's affected the market and I will transfer this into a positive um, comment because, you know, you, when you talked uh, with Alexis Nicole, you talked about foraging, you know, and foraging can have a science of, uh, you know, like interest or bias, you know, but also need 
um, has been, in my world, the drive behind foraging. So in Venezuela, we hadn't uh, consumed um, amaranth forever. It was actually a very uh, uh, aesthetic plant, you know, for ornamentation. It was what decorated our freeways or our main roads. And with the, the humanitarian crisis happening, all these young TikTokers in Caracas started going on the freeway banks and getting the amaranth and bringing it home and cooking the leaves and drying the flowers and shaking them to get the seeds out. So now they're using amaranth instead of rice. And I'm like, well, okay, so th this is a positive because amaranth is so amazing. For me, delicious, um, but it's also so nutrient rich. So now out of need, we are enhancing our biodiversity and, uh, and, and increasing our culinary palate. And so um, I think whatever, you know, whatever the motivation, but here, you know, this is where we are now. I love that. Yeah. It's like innovation and creativity coming out of necessity. And I mean, like you said, these are ancestral foods and I, I, I hope for all of us that we can learn to tap into more of these foods because you said 30,000 plants out there that have been eaten at some point in history and our reliance on just a few that are monocropped is not a good idea for the future. We've got it. We've got to really diversify. Right. right? Yes. Yes. And it's in our hands. And, and yeah. here in America, we are so fortunate. We are so privileged uh, to what's accessible to us. So that, you know, consider this your call to action <laughs> To um, also, you know, again, if you're at a farmer's market at a produce food stand to to promote that crop, you know, heirloom varieties, mm -hmm. which are uh, ancient varieties that, that the modernized agriculture has sort of like pushed aside, you know, but we it's in our hand. Let's vote with our dollars. Let's yeah. bet with our dollars and let's be part of the solution. That's great. And for any of the gardeners out there, I also want to remind you that, you know, usually you could, you can also reach out to your local public library. Usually there are kind of seed swaps and seed saver gatherings in, in different places. And if you want to try some heirloom varieties from that would be suitable for your region, that's a great place to start as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's awesome. The swapping bar, there's one of my favorite apps. And I, I live in, uh, in an apartment, so I don't even have... Um, I have uh, uh, herbs, but I don't even have mm -hmm. enough space for uh, for growing. Having fresh herbs is something we can all do in our yeah. windowsill. And I mean, gosh, what flavor it brings to the dishes. Um, and yeah. there's an app called Cross Swap. Uh -huh. and, and so I've been able to connect with, whether it's people that just happens to have a Meyer lemon tree in their backyard and they have too many and they want to you know, swap with me and I give them uh, uh, herbs and they give me some of the, their citruses to people that are growing wild mushrooms in their own little condos uh, and that's one that I'm really happy about um, so there are these apps and these networking opportunities in our communities to connect with other people growing food and caring about the environment and caring about what we eat that we can swap stuff with that's amazing well, Alejandra, where can I send people to find you? What's your website? Uh, my website is my name, alejandraschrader.com. Okay. And across all social media, I am at Chef Ale, A-O-E, Schrader, my last name. Fantastic. Well, I know I will definitely be following your work. I'm going to be trying out some of these amazing recipes. <laughs> and um, it's just been such a pleasure to meet you. And I love your energy um, around around human and planetary health. And I love this takeaway message of, again, everyone can contribute a grain to the mountain. So we can all, we can all build this together. I think that's beautiful. Yes. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Um, I want to send a big shout out of thanks to our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth of Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. I also want to let you guys know, if you want to help support the show, you can get me a cup of coffee by going to buymeacoffee.com slash foodiepharma. 
Um, I really appreciate the support. It helps us to cover our production costs. Um, if you'd like some fun swag, we also have some great um, t-shirts and bags and coffee cups that have the Foodie Pharma logo on it. And you can go to mysterycontrol.com to do that. And that also helps us support the show. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and we'll see you next time.